Hello, this is Kai Marie, and you are listening to episode number 12, season one of the Healing Element Podcast. If you are watching this episode on the Healing Element Podcast YouTube channel, please be sure to like and subscribe. If you are listening by audio, please be sure to download today's episode. Today's topic is fatherless black sons, the lasting trauma of an absentee parent. Hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Healing Element Podcast, a weekly discussion giving you the tools to understand and heal from intergenerational trauma. I am your host, Kai Marie. To find out more information about the topics discussed today, visit kaimarie.com. Hi, this is Kai, and welcome to the Healing Element Podcast. I am here with my guest, Brandon Jones, once again. Um, If this is your first time joining us, uh, Brandon, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Greetings. Uh, My name is Brandon Jones. I am a psychotherapist, professor, and behavioral health consultant based out of the Twin Cities of Minnesota, so that's Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, My background, I have a bachelor's degree in sociology, I have two master's degrees. My first is in what's called community psychology, which is a form of social psychology. And the second is in psychotherapy from Adler Graduate School with a focus on marriage and family therapy. Awesome. So we're so happy to have you again on the podcast. Um, And our title for today's episode is Fatherless Black Sons, The Lasting Trauma of an Absentee Parent. I just wanted to say before we dive into today's conversation, how Brandon, how this connection was made with um, Brandon and I. So I saw Brandon on several episodes of the Fleet Matthews show on YouTube, and I just saw how he was really able to speak to the historical trauma um, of African Americans and also just speak very bluntly about our experience um, and also how it affects relationships and children. So because of that, I sent an email with fingers crossed (laughs) that he would read the email and actually respond, which he did. And we've had several conversations after that. So I wanted to thank him for being open to being on a podcast that was new um, with someone he didn't know, but through conversations, um, he agreed to come on the episode and start to, and have the conversation. So I'm really appreciative of that. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, And so today we're going to talk about understanding the root causes of black boys growing up without their father and examining how we can begin to heal and change the narrative. Uh, So this is a topic that we hear a lot about um, in mainstream news about um, single parents in the black community, especially households in which the mother is the head of household. And we kind of haven't delved into why that happens and also how does that affect the children. Um, It's really taken a deep dive into our community and also what we can do to begin to change that. And so, um, Brandon, just wanted to start off with kind of identifying what is an absentee parent, because a lot of times we think of a a parent physically not being there, which is what we will discuss today. But also that could be if there's um, if a parent isn't there emotionally for their child as well. So can you explain that to us as we start to have this conversation? Absolutely. So for me, the definition of absentee parent is a parent that is not engaging in the cultiva- uh, cultivation of the child. So they're not cultivating the child and becoming a young person and eventually an adult. And yes, it can be, um, the person can be there, like the father can be there or the mother can be there, but they might not have that connection where they're, you know, actively teaching the young person something or actively helping this young person grow. Um, Now, you are always teaching your children something. I'm a product of pretty much a single parent home. I had a stepfather, but he was pretty much an absentee father. So when he was around, he was terrorizing things. And when he wasn't around, things seemed to be a lot more calmer, but we didn't have a dad around, so to say. So I've experienced what that's like to have an absentee parent, even when they're around and they're causing harm. And the biggest thing is for a parent to be engaged is not to cause harm and help cultivate that young person as best as possible. Awesome. And so some of the reasons that, as you said, if a parent is not there, maybe emotionally or even physically, again, physically is what we're going to be focusing on in this conversation. But if someone isn't there emotionally for their kids, um, generally speaking, sometimes what are the reasons why that would occur? 
it could be a lot of things. It could be um, there's relationship dynamics with that uh, other parent. Like we're focusing on fathers. Mm -hmm. So if they have an issue with the mother or the child, one of the reasons why they're not there. It could be they were never intended to be together. They end up having a sexual engagement. Child was born from it. And then that's why they're not there. The father could be incarcerated, which are many um, young people who grow up in the black community. A lot of fathers have been incarcerated or they're on probation in the state um, where they typically see their child. Um, some people may have charges where they have sex abuse charges and they can't be around their child because of those reasons, because of some sexual assault that may have taken place. Or people may have been dead. Unfortunately, we have a lot of grief in the black community. A lot of that's around black men dying before they're supposed to. A lot of black men that die are fathers. So it could be that reason. Um, the father may be <clears throat> in, uh, working in a different city or a different town where they have a job because that's where the economic opportunity is. So they're not with their family and all they do is send money back home. So there's a lot of different elements and things that can take place, right? The father could be in the military overseas and, you know, um, they're just not around because they're actively on duty or they're working. There's a lot of different things that take place for a parent to be absent. And no matter what the reason is, it does have an impact on the children and on the other parent who is present. Right, very true. And so when we look at more specifically to our community, the African-American community, and we see the numbers of households that are um, single parent with the mother as head of household. And we also can think about this in a context of the system in which we live in a system in which we are under a system of white supremacy and how that impacts our household. And so if you look at numbers, um, as you said, as some, in some cases where um, the father may not be in the household, it could be because of employment reasons, um, maybe because lack of employment, um, just not having the resources. There could be also issues with mental and emotional health, trauma that he experiences. So could you speak to some of those factors and how they could have an impact on whether a father stays in their child's life? And this is, a, again, a Black father staying in his child's life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, as, as a Black man, there are a lot of stressors that we go through on a daily basis. I mean, just being a father or not, just waking up as a Black person trying to figure out what do I wear to work? How should I wear this? You know, should I shave my beard? All these types of things are important and unfortunately add unnecessary stress onto us as a people. Now, if you have additional barriers to that, you just compound that stress. So you might, you know, you might have a criminal record or you might be, you might have a chemical dependency issue where you can't, you know, you struggle with drinking or using drugs, or you may have a mental illness that is preventing you from being around that family dynamic because it's hard to just deal, quote unquote, deal with the person or live be around that person. And those issues are preventing you from being the father that you can be because of the dynamics in the household. And it's not either safe or comfortable, et cetera, for you to be a part of that. And that does happen to a lot of people where just their life circumstances are not a good family dynamic. Yeah. Could you say that one more, it uh, kind of, Zoom kind of freezed on us, that last part about family dynamic, I think you said? Yeah, yep. So pretty much your life circumstances may be preventing you from being inside of the family dynamic, whatever those life circumstances are. Okay. And so thinking about it that way, and also um, as far as what you grew up in. So if you are a black male, you have a son, but you also grew up without a father or without an mm -hmm. example of what it means to be a father, how to even operate in that space, could that also now produce some type of trauma as to now you have to parent your yeah. child, but it's like, I don't even know how to do this. From my own existence, right? I pretty much grew up without a dad. Um, the oldest, I have two younger brothers. They have the same father, and that was my stepfather. He was in and out of our lives all the time. Mm -hmm. And when he was around, it was just a lot of domestic violence, arguing, fighting, etc. And <clears throat> we're freezing a little. examples, because that was it. Like he was male example. He so I remember having no male examples. He was the male example. And him being the male example, I knew that it was not right. It was wrong. The things that he did, he didn't make any of us feel comfortable or safe. And there, were very, there weren't very many moments of love or care from him. So I pretty much grew up without a foundation of what a father is. I actually called it, you know, fathering without a foundation. 
Now, I dealt with that trauma and that pain just looking at it from my own identity and development as a black man. And it really didn't hit me until I became a father myself. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have a son. I have two daughters. But it still impacts me because I still was like, wow, here I am. I'm a father. I, was int I intended to be a father. I tried to have a baby with my wife. When the baby came, then my trauma kind of kicked back in. It was triggered because I'm like, oh, man, I can't. I got to now I have to make sure that the experiences that I had will never be a part of this baby's life, mm -hmm. this child's life. And that, that hit me hard. I didn't know what to do with that. Like I was in my own kind of psychological to go to counseling and figure out how do I address my issues so I make sure that I can be the best father that I can be. Now, society looks at black men in many different ways when it comes to fathering. One of the weirdest things that has ever happened to me was like two days after uh, my first child, my, me and my wife had our first child. Mm -hmm. We had our child at a birthing center and a birthing center is very different than a hospital. So at a birthing center, you get birth and you're like out of the birthing center the same day. So you're like in and you're out. So what ended up happening was we had our baby and then we left and then like the next day we had to go to Target. So we went to Target and we went shopping with our brand new baby. Mm -hmm. And my wife had went to a separate aisle and I was with the cart and the baby and the baby was crying. So I just picked her up and I just kind of was holding her and we were just chilling. Mm -hmm. And I waited for my wife to come back from the other aisle because I'm not going to be pushing the baby all the way around, right? Mm -hmm. And this white woman came, <laughs> she came and said, oh my God, you're such a great father. And then she just walked away. And I was just like, a compliment, but at the same time, I felt like she was kind of sneak dissing. I don't know if people know what sneak dissing means. So a cultural translation yeah, is <laughs> of a sneak diss is when someone's insulting you, right? Someone's insulting you kind of, you know, very slickly or maybe on a slide. Like they're, they're, they're giving you a compliment, but there is a backhanded compliment. So that's what a sneak diss is. And I'm like, man, I kind of felt like she's insulting me. And now from a context of a black man, many people won't understand why that is somewhat insulting. Because from her paradigm and her viewpoint is that you just holding your baby makes you a great father. Mm. I haven't been a father for 48 hours yet. I don't even know what being a father is. But mm. for this white woman to see a black man holding a baby automatically in her head said, wow, this must be a great dad. Because the social narrative is black men don't take care of their kids. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, that's a huge experience. Now, at this point in time, I'm a black man. I got two master's degrees. I'm middle class, all this stuff. But the same experience is there because I still get looked at as, oh, he, his presence means that he's great. I could be abusing my wife. I could be sexually abusing that baby. I could be doing a lot of different things. But just the fact that I'm holding a baby for her gave her recognition that I was a great dad. And it was just like, wow, that, like, that sits with me even today on my image of what, a, of what being a black father looks like. Because a lot of people just expect our presence to be great. And being present doesn't make you a father. Mm -hmm. It's about the actions that you take and, again, cultivating that child. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a huge thing when I look at the narratives that come from being a black father and the stressors that come from that, because sometimes it's just us being there and people are giving us a pass because they don't expect us to be there in the first place. Wow, that's deep. Yeah. And so for black fathers, too, like, so for new moms and for black moms, there's, like, lots of blogs. There's Absolutely. All these, like, there's a whole network, really. Yeah. Like, you get you're a doula. Mom, this is yep. what you can do. Mm -hmm. There isn't really a support system. I would say for men in general and for black men, I haven't really found anything. Like, you're a new father. <laughs> yeah. This is what you can expect. And especially for our community that has endured what we have endured. Mm -hmm. um, living in the U.S., but just also our what we've endured in within our community, right? Aside mm -hmm. from outside racism that exists, just growing up in impoverished conditions or right. single parent households, there's not really a support system for new Black fathers to go through for someone to say, "Okay, listen, your father now understanding maybe you didn't have a father in your life, right? Uh, your father in your life, or understanding that maybe he was there, but as you." Ex if you, as you have stated, maybe wasn't there emotionally or was kind of in and out your life. So this is what you may experience in this, not, in this right. new role. Right. Because traditionally what has happened is your father was that resource. You know, that's how it's supposed to be. You, your father is supposed to tell you what it's like to be a dad once you conceive a child. But over time, we started to conceive children differently and we started to look at the institution of family very different. There was one point in time where you might have two young people 
engaging in a relationship and they end up, you know, getting pregnant. Mm -hmm. And then we have what's called a shotgun wedding. So you were forced mm -hmm. to get married to that person, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a different level of respect to the, the institution of a family. Mm -hmm. But what has happened over time is we've lost that kind of expectation that we're going to cultivate a family and people can just get pregnant and have babies and keep moving on without that accountability to one another. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you start to lose the the accountability and the kind of, um, what am I trying to say here? You lose the accountability, but you also just you lose that expectation that fathers are important because the narrative in the community has been, I'm an independent black woman. I'll take care of my kids. I got my job. I got my education and we don't need you. Mm -hmm. Right. And black men inherit those messages of, we don't need you. Mm -hmm. And then when black men aren't present because they need it, then we see all the other ramifications. What we do know from research, and this is for ethnic groups across the board, mm -hmm. is that fathers are important for a lot of different reasons. But really, it's two stable parents are very important for the development of young people. Mm -hmm. But when you take out, you know, fathers and you don't have any other male role models that are in place of that, that are constructive, then we start to see all these other issues like cliques and gangs being formed because those boys are still looking for that belongingness to some masculine energy. And the masculinity in the community has been um, distorted towards this kind of violent, hypersexual kind of focus. And that's, you know, that's just what, how it's manifested. I'm not going to shift blame on, blame on who's done it or how it's been done, mm -hmm. but there's been a, it, there has been a kind of um, development of this distorted masculinity. And that's where your father would come in to teach you to bring you into manhood. Mm -hmm. So for me, we don't have we don't have rites of passages anymore into manhood. Mm -hmm. Our rites of passages into manhood have become traumatic, and we have become we have developed into manhood through trauma. Mm -hmm. All right, I used to run groups, um, so a lot of my work is with boys, with young adolescent black men and young black men. And I used to do groups. I haven't done groups in a couple years now, but my last group that I did, um, actually every group that I did, but really. My last group was with these 16 year olds and it's very interesting. It's 14 through 16 was these young boys. So ninth, 10th or eighth, ninth and 10th grade. Mm -hmm. And in my group, I have a curriculum and the first group is on masculinity and identity. Mm -hmm. And the first question I asked them is raise your hand. If you're a man, of course, these little 14 year olds, all these boys, they're going to raise their hand. I'm a man. I'm a man. And then my next question, so that's a setup, right? So that's the hook. The next question is how do you know? And the answers that I would hear in these groups scared me to death. It'd be because I had sex, because um, I had sex with an older woman, because I got a baby on the way, because I can carry my own pistol. I had to take care of my little brothers and sisters, and I've been doing it for the last couple of years. Like, all these things. I went to jail, and I was able to survive that. And it's like, you went to little juvie jail, and now you think you're a man? <laughs> but for them, they have associated manhood with being able to deal with adversity that comes from living in an urban environment, which is traumatic or I've been shot, or I got jumped, I got a pit, all these things are trauma. Mm -hmm. But for them, being able to be part of that and be resilient in it from their perspective, that's their resilience, makes mm -hmm. them a man. And the, so it's a distorted understanding of masculinity and manhood that these young men have developed into. And then it just carries on and moves forward because those types of ideals of manhood get celebrated in our community. Oh, look, somebody get out of jail, we have a party for them. Like we should welcome people out of jail, but we have, I mean, it's almost like a graduation when somebody gets out of jail. Like mm -hmm. It's like a big thing, right? right? We have these things, oh, you got another baby on the way. It's just like, it's celebratory. You get a little handshake and then we move on, right? Mm -hmm. Mom, baby mama get a big old baby shower. Daddy, you lucky if you dare to just take pictures, right? They mm -hmm. want you to carry stuff to the car. That's what, you're, <laughs> that's what you're rolling. But we don't have those types of things to celebrate us. We have trauma that leads into our celebration of how we become a man. And that's one thing that's very important is it's important for other black men to create, especially black men that are constructive, to create those spaces for these black boys to develop creativity, to be able to move forward and to understand that you can see manhood in many different places. There's a lot of boys who are interested in things that aren't cool socially to black people so they don't do them. Like I know a lot of black boys who love anime, but they don't see themselves in anime. They don't see that as something they need to play basketball. So they start doing stuff to fit the norm or the expectation of the cultural norm that they might not normally do because they want to feel accepted as a young black man. It's like, why'd you do that? It's like, I don't know. I'm like, what would you rather, like, this is what happens in counseling. I'll ask them, what would you rather be doing? Man, if I could just sit back and watch anime and draw, I'll be good, but I got to be out here 
the people think I'm a nerd or mm -hmm. nothing. Like, the expectation is you're supposed to toughen up and move forward. So mm -hmm. we have to be able to cultivate these young men through something outside of trauma. It can't just be trauma that these young men are ushered into manhood through. Yeah, and that makes you raising that point makes me think of um, this documentary I was watching. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but I know that there was this segment in which this young boy, he was probably like 12, 13 years of age, and he was constantly acting out in school. Like he was getting into fights. Mm -hmm. Const if, he, if somebody wasn't going up to him to fight, he was going up to somebody else trying, getting into a fight nonstop. And so his mom, single parent household, and this is not to knock single parents at all. This is just, we're just having a conversation about the impact of growing up without um, a black boy, especially growing up without his father in his life. But so this young kid, you know, he's growing up there, his father wasn't in his life, um, which we later found out first, it was kind of just showing the issues that he was experiencing in school. He wasn't focused in school. Um, and I don't think that there was a diagnosis for him. It was just, his mom was just trying to figure out how to get him to calm down, pay attention in school and stop fighting. And so later there's the segment where you really, saw like the little boy in him come out because you know he's walking around in school being the right. you know the tough guy right and then uh there was this scene in which he was by himself and he was writing a letter so the interviewer said oh who are you writing a letter to and he said to my dad and of course the interviewer asked it said well where's your dad he's like he's in jail and so um now i'm gonna try not to get emotional it was just so touching <laughs> yeah um so the interviewer said where's your dad he said he's in jail and so um, he's like, I'm just writing him a letter because I miss him. I just mm. want my dad. And he yeah. just balls. Balls, yeah. And, and then it went right back to the trouble he was having. Like, there was no yeah. time to, like. Process it. Process that. Understand, right. like, okay, this is the reason. There's a deeper reason right. why he's behaving the way he is. Right. And, um, you know, his mom under, I don't know if she really understood mm -hmm. how much he missed his father. Mm -hmm. um, I think she was probably, and not making excuses, but I think she's in survival mode trying to take Absolutely. more than one child. Absolutely. Um, I imagine she grew up without her father, so she could be thinking, well, I grew up out with my dad, like, and I'm right. fine. <laughs> so, right. yeah. and that has become the norm for the most part, generally speaking, in our community. So it's like, pull yourself together. You need to get your education. I need to stop coming out of work because that was the other part. She kept, she yeah, had to leave work, work to yeah, go, and get, you know, because he kept getting into trouble. Yep. And so there was no time for anyone to sit with him and say, how do you feel about your dad being away? Right. Yeah. It was, it was. Yeah. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that we have this expectations that dads may not be there and it, it literally it's an expectation um you know one of the things i want to make very intentional as being a black dad is that i'm involved with anything that my girls do um and one of the things that happened actually recently it's kind of funny because this literally happened a couple of days ago um my daughter the initial because they were looking at these awards that i have because i need to put my stuff up on the walls and i said dad what's the l for in your name and i said that's for lavelle and they just start laughing like Lavelle. What, what name is that? And I said that's my dad's name. And they were like, "Your dad?" Because they've never they never met him. Mm. Like, yeah, yeah, I have a dad, but I don't. We don't talk about him. I can show you all what he looks like. I can show you on Facebook. So they're like, "Let's see your dad." So I pull up Facebook. I pull up my dad, and they're like, "You look just like your dad, <laughs> right?" And then I had to tell them, "Well, I didn't grow up with my dad." And they were like, "What? That doesn't make any sense." It was just a foreign concept to them. Because we live in a suburban neighborhood where most of the dads are around. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uncommon for them to meet young people without their dads. So I had to break it down to my girls. Now they're six and four, mm -hmm. that there are people who grow up without fathers, mm -hmm. right? And then I had to tell them, and it's so funny because they didn't even recognize it. Um, like, they don't have any aunts. They have all uncles. So on their mom's side and my side, they have uncles. And I had to break it down to them, like, yeah, like, look at so-and-so, your cousin. Like, they go, they live in two different houses. So they see their cousins when they're with their uncles, with their dads, but they don't always see them when they're with their moms, right? Because all my, you know, one of my brothers is married, one isn't, and then my um, brother-in-law, he's not married, and he has children too. So I said, yeah, they grow up with their dads, but some people live in two, some people don't see their dad. 
and that's and they just it was such a foreign con- like their mind was bl- they were more blown away by that than seeing their grandfather on Facebook <laughs> like it's one of those type of things <laughs> but my intention was to make sure they understood that men in your lives are important now their situation is a little different because they have all these uncles but if it was the reverse and they had only aunts and I was the only male that would be a lot different so it, they would see that the dads aren't there but right. from their their paradigm is that these men are always around and I had to tell them and help them understand that that's not always true. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, for a lot of black kids, it is the truth for them to not see men around. And it's an expectation that a man may not be around. We literally prepare our girls not to be with men, right? We, we actually raise our girls to be independent and to not depend on a man, which I don't think is the thing that you should be doing, but I understand why it's done. Mm-hmm. But we do prepare, and we prepare our boys to be the best men that they can be, but we just let them run free and do everything. So it's not a lot of cultivating, again, of what proper masculinity is supposed to be, what's healthy, right? We talk about right. toxic masculinity, and we need we need boys to cry more and show their emotions. The saying that stuff is good, but what does that look like in this real world, mm-hmm. right? Having a, having an ability to process your emotions is healthy for anybody. But for a black male, you know, you can be emotional about a lot, about a lot of stuff because you got a lot of things against you, but you have to be able to have some social emotional intelligence to deal with the world that you're in. So being able to cultivate young men constructively so that they're moving towards something that they can be proud of. A lot of black boys, this is another thing that I talk a lot about, is a lot of black boys don't have proper confidence. They, mm-hmm. And it's around, you know, do physically, whether that's run fast, jump high, you know, bench press this, or what they can do sexually, right? So how many people can they engage into a sexual manner? But black boys don't see a lot of other things that they do in the world that has an impact. So I can I can see how many people that I've had sex with. I can see that. I can see that I dunked a basketball or that I ran, you know, a 40-mile dash in under five seconds. I can see that. Mm -hmm. But what other things do black boys get to see that they have done or other men like them have done outside of cause pain? That's very important because that role modeling is huge. And this is what I talk about. Talks about fatherhood. I have to make sure that I display my fatherhood because black boys don't always see that. Right. Right. I have to make sure that I display the things that I've done. I'm not bragging about it. I just want, I'm, I know for a lot of black boys, I'm the black first for them. I'm the first male educator for them. Mm-hmm. I'm the first black male therapist. I'm the first black man that stood up for them in school. Mm-hmm. I'm the first black person that tried to help their mom and didn't try to have sex with her. Mm-hmm. Right? There's, I'm the first for a lot of that stuff. Yeah. And I, I am always seeing a different narrative by being a role model. And that's something that's very important for most black men for us to do. So, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> no, you dropped some heavy jewels there. I was yeah. just sitting back and just, yeah. Like, yeah. I think your um, the points that you made it, it needs to be said in our yeah. community, um, and so when you have young black boys, as you said, a lot of times you're the first, the first time mm-hmm. that they can really go to someone um, that they trust, you know, without this expectation of um, if you do something for me, then or if I do something for you, you do something for me. So that's ex- you know that's extremely important. So. Um, in thinking about that, since you're the first, a lot of times they don't have a relationship with their father. Um, how does that impact them psychologically? We did, you did say how that leads to a lot of yeah. times joining gangs or just trying to fill that void. Yeah, it's just giving them a different perspective on life. Um, mm-hmm. You know, most black boys don't know what a psychologist is, right? They don't know what a therapist is. So now I'm educate, I'm helping educate and give them a different perspective that these are other things that you can do. Like, you don't have to just become an athlete or a police officer or, you know, these other things. These are other things that you can do. Like, there's a reason why most black boys don't say they want to become lawyers and doctors because they don't see black lawyers and doctors, right? Mm-hmm. They don't have a vision for those things. So psychologically, what I try to do is just provide different perspectives so that they can have different what we call mental schemas mm-hmm. on things. Wait, what is possible for me? How does this impact my self-esteem? Oh, I can be a black man that talks, you know, confidently, but also be calm, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the black men, a lot of the boys that I end up working with, that they come in contact with, they're yelling at them, right? They're coaches, so they're Mm -hmm. screaming, trying to have performance, or they're, you know, or they're family members who are being brought into the picture for some discipline, or they're teachers who are all stressed out and they don't got a lot of time or effort. Like, so a lot of the black males that they do come in contact with aren't always the most constructive. So you get somebody like myself, 
I'm not here to be your coach. I'm not here to be your dad. I'm not here to do any of that. I'm not here to help you process through the situation so you can move forward. Right. And that's just a different type of engagement that mm -hmm. these young black men go through that they don't always have, unfortunately. Yeah. And I'm glad that you mentioned about coaching because I used to be a huge, a huge um, college basketball, like it was a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my brackets and all that. I was like a huge fanatic when it came to uh, watching college basketball. But in that, there would be like, um, especially right before the tournaments, they would do like a little story about one of the players and oh, usually I know where this came is going. from some type of, yep. you know, poor neighborhood, single family household. He goes to coach, coach comes in, is this father figure that he never had. But the sad part is, is when you really understand sports, like these coaches, which I'm going to speak general here, but basically they're just, they're like, okay, you have a talent. Yep. I like your talent. Yep. If you come to my school, you can help make my school money. Yep. Right. And you also, if that coach is good enough, right, that's able to recruit, or the recruiter is able to get um, some young guys that can really play, not only does that help bring money in, but that also helps the coach because then he's able to, that helps his brand, that helps yep. him get an increased salary. Mm -hmm. um, he benefits from that. And so when I see a lot of the young ball players and they're looking at the coach, literally like, I love this guy. Like, this is a guy that mm -hmm. took me under his wing. And you see at the back and like, actually, this coach is using you <laughs> to help build mm -hmm. um, their empire, their empire. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. just it's so sad when you see the relationship for what it is. But a lot of these young black boys believe that this is no a genuine friendship, a genuine relationship. Can you speak to Ooh. that one? You ready to go deep? Cause let's dive. I'm okay. All right. We about to go, we about to go deep sea diving for real. This might get your podcast shut down. All right. So <laughs> one thing that <laughs> I, I gotta make sure you are the focus here. We gotta switch this up a bit. One thing <laughs> <laughs> one thing that's important to understand is that college sports is a business, especially sports we have mostly black athletes because those are the, rev the revenue generating sports. So football and basketball for the most part. The fact that those black men, because I see that all the time, I knew exactly where you're going because I see this all the time. And it always like makes me feel weird because I've never had that dynamic with any of my coaches, even though when I was recruited and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that like they were like my dad. Like that just seems weird to me. But I understand it because these black males haven't had a black a, a person, a male person come into their life for the most part. Sometimes a grandfather maybe or an uncle, but typically they haven't had a person come in and show them a level of care. Even if it is temporary, that level of care is very transactionary. But guess what? That's what we expect as black people because that's how black dads are treated any damn way. It's a transaction. Go ask your daddy for them shoes. Go ask your daddy for that. Go ask your daddy. That's a transaction. So when coach comes in and you go ask your new daddy, coach, for such and such, and he provides it for you, there's no difference in that social dynamic. So the transactional piece, there's no difference because black fathers are seen as a transaction. So we talk about that genuineness. Black kids don't know what being genuine is unfortunately yeah. Yeah. Like, like think about this yeah. it's a transaction mm -hmm. so i'm gonna give you stuff because that's what black dads do they give they just give you stuff they're not here to cultivate anything and then when your college basketball career is over in three years or four years and you get shipped out and then you wonder why coach ain't returning your calls no more because you ain't bringing no money and he's doing this for another set of 14 ball players mm -hmm. right it's a transaction but that's how black that's how black fathers have been reduced is just transactional because they ain't going to be here anyway. Mm -hmm. So go get what you can get out of your daddy and then we're going to keep it moving up in here. That, that's what's happened. <laughs> yeah. We went deep. <laughs> I could go a little deep. I had to edit it. I, I, I did self edit a lot. I was like, let me not go see. But, the, but, but <laughs> I got to be very careful what I say. But black men have been reduced to what we can provide for other people. So when we talk about why black men don't share our emotions and why black men don't always have these humanistic characters, characteristics that we show, it's because of how society's viewed us. And unfortunately, the black community has used and looked at black men just like everybody else has. And that's the deep part that we don't want to have the conversation. It's all transactional. What you going to do, right? When something goes bad, what do we look at? We look at black men. How y'all black men going to fix this? Mm-hmm. 
I don't know. Right? right? It's, it's, so we have to, when we talk about relooking at the dynamics in our community, when we talk about black fathers and their interactions with black boys and black girls, we have to look at it beyond what we are giving, right? Because there's, there's a level of being a provider that's not just about giving, giving, giving. Sometimes it's about protecting and cultivating what you have. And black men don't have a lot of say so in that. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how black fatherhood has been reduced is to what are you providing? And this gets into the whole child um, support situation and all that mm-hmm. is you need to give to be a part of this family dynamic. And if you ain't given nothing, why are you here? Because the expectation is not for you to be here in the first place. Right, right. Yeah. Wow. I feel like I just got to sit with that. We might have to just end with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just deep. to sit with that. That is it, deep. It, it's messed up, but, but that's how black men have been reduced. I mean, we have literally been reduced to anything. So when you see a black man like myself, where I'm out with my girls, it is a phenomenon, mm-hmm. right? It is something that's like, oh my, look at that black dad holding those two little girls' hands, right? right, right. That, that is something that's so rare to people because of the expectation that black men aren't supposed to be doing anything in the first place. Mm-hmm. It makes somebody look like me look like Superman when I'm just struggling trying to figure out how to be a dad in general. And my and my bare minimum efforts seem you know paramount mm-hmm. because of the lack of the lack of expectation. Wow. So we so looking at how, uh, and again, I just kind of want to sit and just let you continue. <laughs> I guess episodes do have to come to an end, but <laughs> there's so much to impact there. Um, so saying like how that impacts like how you then uh, or how a young black boy growing up with a father how that impacts them. How does that also impact his relationship with his mom? And I say that because mm-hmm. I, my parents, they got divorced when I was 16. Um, so before a divorce happens, obviously there's many things that occur <laughs> before that's the result. And so both my mom and dad, they had their own uh, view of why the marriage was headed that way. And they did share with me. I was the only child. <laughs> So I was the person that they expressed their displeasure with between like my mom would tell me about my dad, my dad would say something about my mom. So I heard it from both sides, but I was actually there. I knew both of them. So I could talk to my experience, but I think of young black boys where maybe say they never met their father, they just have their mom. He, you know, as far as the truth, because the truth of what both my parents were saying was somewhere in the middle. But if I only heard it from one side, I could end up thinking that one of them loved me less, didn't care about me, was dot, dot, dot. I won't go into all those details. So how does, um, in in a household in which there's just the mom, maybe the child's father is um, not in his life, how does that then affect the relationship the child would have with his mother? Yeah. ways um you know from one extreme to the next i've seen and we can just use this sport example for um example hold on one second you might want to pause it for a second okay hold on okay we're back are you there so one of the things and we can use the sport example to continue on with this thought Mm -hmm. i've seen it i've seen this happen two different ways i've seen it where black boys have Um, kind of put mom on this huge pedestal where mama is everything. And I've seen boys reject their moms from what they've seen, how moms kind of engage in the situation. Mm -hmm. We could use the sports to look at it from both ways. Now, typically, like the draft, right? We have NFL drafts, NBA drafts. What's one of the first things black men say when they get drafted? I like to thank my mama. (laughs) I'm going to thank my mom. I'm about to buy my mama a house, right? Because we have this, we have this association on we we needed to as children, black male children, we need to take care of big mama. We gotta take care of mama, right? I'm gonna put mama in the house. But you also see those few athletes that don't, and you hear about those like, oh, he didn't buy, he gave his mom ten thousand dollars and didn't talk to her ever again, right? Because mm-hmm. they just moved on. It's like finally I I got on, I got the thing that I need, and now I'm gonna just move away from my mom and move away from that craziness in my family, mm-hmm. and that happens all the time. Children hear and see things that you don't expect them to hear and see. We try to protect our kids from stuff, but guess what? They get access to stuff. They're not slow, right? They understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. And when you have situations where parents haven't um, 
being able to stay together for whatever reason, the child's going to make their own decision on what goes on. Both parents will try to craft the narrative for the child on why things didn't go right, but the child still knows exactly what is going on. It's mm -hmm. like, well, dad, if you stop coming home like this and my mom stopped Right, right. well i know mom be talking so and you are not know, seeing this part like kids see and hear all that type of stuff they, mm -hmm. they they have access more than what we think and they've already made their own judgments on who's right or who's wrong in the situations mm -hmm. now when you have an absentee father what ends up happening is a lot of times the moms will do two things right they'll say you know your dad didn't do this and that's why this happened like they'll blame the dad or they won't say anything about dad which both can be harmful, right? Mm -hmm. It's like they just don't talk about the dad because they don't want to bring up any old wounds or they don't want to bring any old hurts or affect the child, et cetera. But they don't, sometimes there needs to be an idea of who dad was or where dad is and an understanding. And we shouldn't be trying to project what the young person is going to understand about their father. Mm -hmm. When we do that, what ends up happening is we start to develop ideals of the mom, whether they're good or bad. And like I said, I've seen those two extremes where mm -hmm. mom's on a pedestal, can't do, you know, you can't do anything wrong to mom. And I've seen it where people just completely isolate from mom and don't even deal with her. Wow. I wanted to bring up, this is a conversation that I actually had with my fiance and we were talking about like that single parent household. We're actually, we were talking about um, this interview. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it led to this conversation. So I wanted to get your thoughts. So we were talking about how, and I don't know if this is going to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All this is going to get you in trouble. <laughs> so we were talking about when there is a, a single parent household, and this was more so when the dad isn't there. And again, more specifically talking about the African-American community. And so we were saying how sometimes the relationship that the son, especially the older son, may have with the mom can be a little interesting, meaning like, he kind of, not in a sexualized way, but he kind of serves the role as her man, like that emotional role as her man. Yep. So like to your point, when you said, uh, as far as the, you're watching the NBA draft and they want to buy their mom a house or an NBA basketball player, NFL player, they want to buy mom a house. They want to make sure mom is good. She can retire early. Like usually things that the man of the house, right? Like the a role the father right. would play. And so we were talking about it's interesting how like it can kind of get confusing probably with the son because he's trying he's like that's my mom but he also is filling this void of you know if she's doesn't have a partner he's kind of also right. filling that emotional role right which then that can so how would that affect him and then um you know when he gets in a relationship <laughs> like, figuring out yep. how to Cut and then that, yep now uh, the new partner don't like mama because they're interfering they're intervening on that dynamic and that bond yeah, yeah. <laughs> i actually just had a counseling session with somebody about this it's kind of funny um she's like Brandon, i don't know why his mama i don't know I was like, like, tell me a little bit about his family breakdown and pretty mm -hmm. much scenario just laid out he was the only son uh he wasn't the oldest but he was the only son he became the man of the house at early age and mama always kept him close because we love our boys right we love our boys to death Mm -hmm. So there's an actual term for this. It's called emotional incest. I don't know if you've heard that term, <laughs> but that's what it, emotional incest, where we have this dynamic between um, the between black ones and black mothers, and this dynamic happens because there's still this ideal, which is true from my standpoint, mm -hmm. that you need a man, you need that masculine dynamic inside the family dynamic. Mm -hmm. And in order to have that, men are typically, uh, historically, we protect, produce, and provide, right? Protect, mm -hmm. produce, and provide. And without a father figure in a household, the son kind of steps up and assumes that responsibility and creates this codependency that we call emotional incest. Mm -hmm. Now, this becomes dangerous because a lot of times those black men don't know how to detach from mama. Mm -hmm. They could be in their 40s, right? Mama, six two. He's 45 and he's still, anytime mama rang the phone, he, he's over there, right? He's, he's COVID-19 shopping for mama and everything. Like, what? <laughs> like, it's like, he's just doing everything for mama. Not saying you shouldn't, because you should take care of your, you know, your family. But this is the stuff that ends up happening mm -hmm. is that they start to, they start to do anything for mom because moms always love them. And they love them both as a son and, like you said, like a partner. Mm -hmm. And that can become dangerous and often does become problematic because when son finally gets a female counterpart or gets a woman, those, a lot of times those women and the moms end up having, um, you know, friction 
and they're bumping heads because this woman is coming to dethrone and take the son away from that family dynamic and that comfort zone. Mm-hmm. This happens a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't, there's no research really around why this happens. It's mm-hmm. just one of those weird dynamics that takes place, mm-hmm. but no one really studies this family dynamic of the single mother. Like they don't mm-hmm. study it. They don't study uh, what ends up happening and how these natural things that we still need, like that protective provider um, and producer role is still needed in that family dynamic. And who assumes that? It's a lot of times it's the only son or it's the oldest son or one of the sons that forms this tight bond. It's in my family, right? Mm -hmm. My youngest brother and my mom have a dependent relationship. They finally broke it off. I don't know how long it's going to last, but they finally broke it off a couple months ago. But every time I talk to my mom, she's asking me about how my brother's doing to make sure you check in on him. And like when COVID-19 started, that was the first thing she called was me. I'm like, why didn't you just call him? Make sure you check on your brother. Make sure he's got some food. And I'm like, all right, mom, I got you. Right. But for her, that's her baby, right? That's her baby. That's the last son that didn't leave yet. He's been too thick and thin with her. And he, he's always been there. I remember my mom got a boyfriend a couple years ago and she wanted to bring him over to the house and my brother lost his mind. And they had to call me to come calm him down. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. Like, why are you mad now? Because she's bringing this, you know, M effort up in the house. I'm like, bro, our mom's like 40 something years old, man. She can date somebody. Why are you tripping? You, your girlfriends come over all the time. Mm-hmm. But for him, it was just like, you know, somebody impeded into mom's space. So he was codependent just like the mom was on their dynamic. And they had this emotional incest type of thing going on. So yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. It's not sexual, right? Right, right but it's still right. this intimate bond and connection between two individuals due to just human nature factors. It, it's a very interesting dynamic. Yeah, and so I know we have to move on, but I have one more thing I yeah. want to talk about. <laughs> Go ahead. So, um, so it does have that confusion, right? So you're not quite sure. Again, you don't know yeah. the role that you're supposed to play. Um, so, let's see. We'll go back to it. We'll go back to it. Okay. Because <laughs> um, I don't want to say, I could, I feel like I could stay on that topic for a little bit longer. <laughs> that's probably a whole other podcast. <laughs> right? Oh, yes, that's what it was. So I said to move on because I forgot what I was going to say, but now I remembered. Got it. So if somebody, so in that situation, um, again, this is a conversation I was having when mm-hmm. you have um, emotional incest, does, and again, this is probably going to get me in trouble again. <laughs> I love black women. <laughs> <laughs> so, but when that happens, could you say that that mom kind of shapes that son that she has that bond with to be the ma- the man that she wants. Mm. Is that also? Yeah, I think that's possible. Um, yeah, and I think that's become his become his own person, right? Because you don't have that right. other father that the other male there to say, "Listen, no, you gotta let him go." Like you said, like the whole rites of passage. Mm-hmm. There's nothing to balance that out, right? So how yeah. does he come to his own identity if? He mm. feels like this is almost like this is his woman, right? I got to make <laughs> this one happy. I got to make That's my woman happy. That's a real good question. I don't know. I would assume that there is a shaping that takes place uh, because mm-hmm. parents shape their kids. I mean, it's just right. part of what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I think what mom is doing is she's cultivating this man um, or young man to be the type of man that she expects to have. I do think that that does take place. Mm-hmm. What does that mean for him? I don't know. Does that mean that he's not becoming his true self? That's a good question. I don't know. But also, I think about it from a standpoint of that's what parents do anyway, is shape their kids to become who they are. Like, you know, you the first, really, talk about personality, the first seven to eight years of a child's life develops the personality. Everything after that is just how they manifest within the world. Mm-hmm. So the personality is already set for this person, but how they manifest, how they function in the world that's going to be done through socialization, which usually takes, starts in like middle school. Okay. So if you're cultivating with mom and you're like 23 years old and y'all have this emotional incest thing, she has cultivated you to be kind of the man that she expects for herself. Mm-hmm. And that, but we can't, I don't know if we can say that that's not who he would end up being anyway, because it might be right. right. And then he ends up with his own female partner at some point, And that might not be the man that she wants. And then she starts to point out things but now you're going against mama and that's what becomes a problem. So I think that there is some shaping that takes place with mama. Okay. So we'll leave with that being said, we'll (laughs) leave mom alone. Love mom. (laughs) And we'll move on. So, um, 
for young black boys, they don't have their father in their life. There could be the sense of abandonment. Mm -hmm. um, dad not being there, not sure why he's not there, as we said. If mom isn't really explaining what happened or even mentioning, you know, right. anything about dad. So how could that feeling of abandonment affect a young black boy and then affect his relationship then with other black men that come in his life? Like such as you, like when you come into yeah. your life, a healthy relationship, how could that affect right. your ability to connect? Yeah, I think one of the things that happens is a lot of suspicion. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, well, what does this black man want? Right. Like I haven't had a lot of black men around and now here you come showing up. What do you want? So I think there's some suspicion there. Um, a lot of times the things that I've noticed, too, is a lot of like po what I call posing. So black males will start doing things to kind of test you to see if you're really like legit here to help. Or are you is there an ulterior motive or something, you know, behind the scenes that you're trying to do? Um, I think that there's a lot of attachment issues as well that take place. So they don't know how to formulate a healthy relationship with the black man because they haven't had the experience to. Um, so then you have to break down those kind of attachment barriers and those trust barriers that take place. Um, but abandonment's a huge thing. And a lot, I think there's a lot of black, just black people, period, but especially black boys that feel abandoned and don't know it. And that's what ends up with a lot of the emotional behavioral disturbances and the things that we see with boys acting out is they're really just feeling like they've been left and that they're not heard and they haven't had the connection that they should with other males, other men that are healthy, especially their fathers. So I think that that's, those are some of the things that I've noticed and that I've encountered is really just trying to break down those barriers as much as possible um, because there's a level of suspicion that this black man's here for something because mm -hmm. he ain't here for me. Yeah. Wow. And so we are going to get to the healing part as we start to um, wind down to the end of our session today, mm -hmm. our episode. <laughs> <laughs> session. I feel like a session. <laughs> I feel like this is a session. <laughs> um, so in saying that, that sense of abandonment. And so now as a young boy transitioning into manhood, mm -hmm. feeling that abandonment, maybe even resentment, yeah. um, just a mixed bag of emotions that as you've seen in our community, there's no, there's no space really for young black boys yeah. to really express how they feel. As I said in that um, documentary I was watching, he was kind of the young boy whose father was incarcerated. He was just kind of in a corner by himself crying with no mm -hmm. one there to comfort and say, okay, let's right. have a conversation. So now we have young Black boys who are growing up, never really sharing how they're feeling. They're now right. transitioning from being a young boy to a young man. How does that then impact um, them not having a father in their life that transition from boyhood to manhood. Mm -hmm. I think that it uh, that transition. I don't think that there is a transition to manhood for many mm -hmm. black boys that don't have fathers. Um, I think that they just stay boys in men bodies. <laughs> like mm -hmm. arrested development is the term that comes to mind, right? So, you know, chronologically and physically, these boys are growing and developing to men, but emotionally. They're and, and even their thought process, cognitively, they're very much still adolescent black boys. I mean, I can't tell you how many men I come across that are in their late 20s, in their 30s, hell, even some in their 40s, mm -hmm. and they still act like they're 16 years old mm -hmm. because there hasn't been a level of socialization to usher them into manhood. Again, myself, I potentially probably fell in this category, but I had other things that kind of steered me towards becoming a man, right? I also had a desire to figure out what the hell that even means. Mm -hmm. And I would read a lot of books on black manhood. And I would, mm -hmm. you know, try to be around black men as much as I can, even though I felt uncomfortable around a lot of black men to try to understand what is this whole idea of what a man's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. To be completely honest with you, I don't think I affirmed my manhood until about maybe four years ago when I really, really got active and became a father and trying to figure out what is this whole dynamic between one, black women and black men, mm -hmm. and two, what does this mean for me as a black man? And when I started to do those deep dives and having conversations with other black men and reading books, um, and then, yeah, that's really what kind of helped me understand that. So I think that there's just a lot of black men who just don't cultivate what manhood is to them. Um, mm -hmm. They have a but I said, I often say it's a distorted ideal of manhood because of who you can have sex with or how many times they've had sex, um, if they can physically defend themselves. Uh, and then usually it stops around that. If they can make some fast money and then it just kind of slows down from that. 
but it's not about cultivating families. It's not about building legacy. It's not about any of those types of things. It's just about these kind of small objects um, and small trinkets and things that they can accumulate now. And then that highlights their manhood. But to me, I think it's a lot more than that. And without other men helping you understand that and see that you never experience it. You know, I look at other ethnic groups and how they cultivate manhood. You know, some ethnic groups have parties when boys turn 13 years old and things like that to say, all right, now you need to start acting a different way. Your behavior has to change now. You are at an age where there's an expectation for you to do things. And then there's cultural things that take place for that boy to start becoming a man. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the black community, that's not always there. You become a man when you turn 18 because you're not your parent, usually your mama's about to kick you out the house. And that's right. it. And that's not, I mean, that's, that's not cultivating anything. It's really a setup, especially in today's economy and, and the situation and how things are today. It's really a setup for failure when we just kick boys out. Boy barely passed high school. He's got limited communication skills. He has no emotional regulation skills. And now you're telling him to go out in the world and figure it out on his own. He's going to struggle. Right. And especially under the system in which we live in, right? Like there right. is racism that he's going to deal with, he's going to encounter in the job Absolutely. walking down the street. I mean, um, although this video and recording will air later in April, um, I've seen as of late because of this whole COVID-19 where black men have come out and said, listen, I'm concerned about wearing a bandana. Absolutely. My mouth covering my nose. And um, there's one article that I saw, I think it was in the Washington Post, in which um, this, these black men were like kicked out of Walmart yep. for wearing the bandana. And it's just like those type of situations we have to share with our black boys. And black Absolutely. Girls, like we're talking about black boys right now. What this society is about. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, they're, as you said, Man. it's kind of like going out into the world and not really being properly prepared and then it's like now go out be a man you haven't been taught right. anything but go out be a man be a productive citizen um and you know don't don't start trouble man and like you don't start trouble you could just be walking down the street not right. doing anything that, you know, how man. do you engage with a police officer how do right. you engage with a boss that like those are all uh Realities. things that we have to be we have to start educating our brothers mm -hmm. about Yesterday, I had to go to um, the grocery store and grab something, just real quick. And I had my wife has a mask. I said, let me borrow your mask. And I've never seen her <laughs> ever concerned for my life like this. Mm -hmm. She looked me dead in my eye and said, Brandon, I don't want you to wear a mask. And I said, so you want me to get, so me, I'm thinking like, so you want me to get coronavirus? She was like, Brandon, like, you might get hurt. And I was like, damn, I didn't even really thought about that. Like, and she was legit like, no, I can't. Like, you, I know I need you to go to the store right now, but you can't wear this mask man and i was like wow and i thought about it, like I put on bandanas like how are we gonna be perceived like if i walk into my bank to cast a check and i got a mask on are they thinking that i may try to rob this bank like mm -hmm. or what what's the thought process and i didn't even put two and two together with that um but i've thought about how are black people going to be seen in the space of COVID 19 but when my wife when my wife said I was like dang I haven't even thought about it and I'm, and I'm just would have walked in the store and God knows what could have happened so yeah it's deep and we have to always keep in mind what system that we do live in and how to respond to it and that's why it's important for us to develop skills um, and be able to have social emotional intelligence skills conflict resolution skills as best as possible because anything can set us off because we're always under that um, kind of threat level mm -hmm. right right and so for those that are uh, black young black boys or black men that are listening today and this really this whole conversation really resonates with them uh, what are some steps that they can take to start to deal with maybe that anger resentment um, feelings that they have of not having their father in their life and just maybe feel lost just kind of out here yeah um, not having real roots um, mm -hmm. Just maybe that whole side of their father's family, they don't even know. So right. That's they me. Like have this last name and they don't even yep. know who this person is. Yep. What I would recommend is um, I would recommend that they talk to their peers, their friends, their black male friends about it. Many black men don't have conversations about the things that trouble us, right? 
the things that cause us anxiety, the things that give us depressive symptoms. I would encourage them to talk to their friends about what does it mean that their dad is not around, whether their friends have a dad or not. I think that that's healthy and constructive dialogue to have. I would encourage black men to find resources, young black men to find resources on YouTube. Use the tools you have. Type in life in America as a black man. And then just start hearing some of the stories. Paying attention to things. Find a black man that speaks to you, right? Just make sure it's not Van Jones. Not just, <laughs> not just I agree joking. with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no that's an in, that. inside <laughs> joke. But, you know, find a black man that speaks to you, right? And, and, and also, I would say, look for black men who do things that you don't know about, right? So don't just look for Steph Curry and LeBron James. Um, look for people or can look for people that you don't even know about that are black men and hopefully that might help inspire you to do something different right mm -hmm. you know you will get put models will get put in front of you on who you who and how you should be as a black man but that shouldn't stop you from being any type of black man that you want so I think that's help I think that those things are helpful I would encourage them to talk to black men and their family that they do have access to whether that black man is constructive or not constructive so I don't like to say good and bad like either they do constructive things or they don't have conversations with those men and get those men to try to open up about why they do the things they do because that gives you perspective on why this person acts like this right if they have a father that's not present but they still have access to talk to their father don't have don't hesitate to ask your dad some questions mm -hmm. unfortunately and this happens to a lot of people it happens to me my father and a lot of black fathers don't come to the young person a lot of times that responsibility and that onus is on the young person to go to the parent. I don't think it should be that way, but for whatever reason, that's how it unfortunately ends up being. Okay. So I know if I want to talk to my dad, I'm going to have to reach out to him. Okay. He's rarely ever going to reach out to me. And that's just, that could be shame. It could be, he could be nervous or scared. It could be a lot of different things, but that's typically what happens. Don't be afraid to be a young person with a voice. Connect who you're, to your dad if you can. Connect to other black men if possible. Seek out opportunities. Now, right now, we're practicing social distancing, so it might be a little bit hard. But if you find a black man, don't hesitate. Go on LinkedIn. Don't hesitate to send them a message and say, hey, what is it like to do your job? Or mm -hmm. tell me more about what you do. And if they live in your city, ask them to take you to lunch. These people, they can find, you know, $20 to take you to lunch and say, hey, I'm, you know, I just want to interview you as a black man. I want to ask you some questions. Do you mind going to lunch? And typically, they'll try to, they'll pay for it because they want to show off, because that's what we do when we do something. We want to show off to you and uh, wear our nice watch that day and all that good stuff to show you something different. And guess what? That's what we should be doing because we should be cultivating these men to see what success can be for them. Um, so those are just some helpful things. What I would say not to do is don't ask your mom about your dad, okay? <laughs> because she's going to give you a skewed perspective on your father and the dynamic that they had. Not saying it's going to be bad, it's just going to be only from her purview, right? And if you can get both sides, I would say then have that conversation. But if it's just one person, I wouldn't recommend that because you're going to formulate your ideas based on a relationship that didn't work for whatever reason. So I would caution talking to your mom about your dad, even if they have a great relationship, right? Even if, let's say they're friends to this day, I would, if you can't get both perspectives, I would say, you know, just formulate your own ideas. Um, so. Awesome. Yeah, and, so, so and for women who, if you're raised, if there are any women that are listening and, and we haven't scared them, <laughs> <any> women away, <laughs> if you're a woman and you're listening and you are a single mom, um, what's some advice that you would give to that single mom um, if the father is not in her son's life? Yeah, I, I would say don't worry about trying to raise a man. Just try to be the most constructive parent that you can be for all your children if you have more than one, right? Mm -hmm. Every kid is different. And if you have multiple boys, those boys are going to come out very different. Just make sure whatever you're doing, you're setting a good example for how to engage and treat women. Um, and you're not, and the other thing, and this happens a lot, and I'm not, this is one of the stereotypes on black um, single moms, but it's very true because I've seen it happen a lot, is don't project your emotions and feelings of the father onto your kids. The father's separate, right? The kids may look like them, they may act like them, they may get on your nerves, but try your hardest not to project how you feel about the dad so much. It's unfortunate, but it is a truth. 
Um, don't do that because when that when you do that, what ends up happening is the young person starts to resent you and their father, even if they don't have the relationship with the dad. They they hate the dad for the pain that the dad's bringing them in the dad's absence. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you're not putting your, your emotions and thoughts and feelings onto the child because of stuff that the dad did. Um, but you can raise healthy children. And if you stay constructive and you teach them good principles, you teach them how to interact and, re and be respectful to adults, um, and you treat them like human beings. You don't treat them like little robots and you, you're going to beat them to death if they don't listen to you. If you treat them with respect, those kids will grow up to be constructive young men. They're going to need some help. They're going to need some guidance and some influence of other men, but that might not be the job that you need to do. Your job may be just to make sure that they're safe and that they're, uh, you know, and that they're living their lives as healthy and and that's that's all you can really do at this point and then you know allow them to kind of figure out and navigate manhood as best as they can because i'm if, if my wife left for whatever reason mm -hmm. i cannot teach my daughters how to be young women mm -hmm. but i can teach them how to be good young people and i can teach them how to inter interact with a man and a black man at that mm -hmm. in the best way as possible but i'll never be able to teach them how to be a young woman I can't, I can't tell them how to, how to deal with their menstrual cycle or anything. I don't know how to do those things. But what I can do is try to make sure that they're healthy, they're safe, and that I help develop them as best as I can. Right. Very true. Um, and, so, and there's no not, because I know that that conversation has come up before with um, women raising men and saying, you know, and it's been both sides. Some people say, well, I've raised my sons by myself. Like, it's not about yeah. you just being by yourself. Like, what is the impact that... Right that young boy has had with not having a father in his life not saying right. that you didn't do it right. but how did that emotionally and mentally impact him mm -hmm. um so no and girls need daddies too yes <laughs> that's yeah, important that would be another good um yeah episode i was gonna say session again <laughs> yeah <laughs> if they feel like a session that means healing is taking place so right? there we go. i love it <laughs> so brandon thank you so much for joining um the healing element podcast again as we start to close our episode today is there anything that you would like to leave our listeners with well yeah um just make sure you check me out on social media platforms i'm at by brandon jones on all social media platforms so that's by Brandon um, Jones on all social media platforms. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Same thing by Brandon Jones. Um, and then you can also check me out on my website, jegna.org and jegna spelled J E G N A. So J E G N A.org. Um, so you can find any, yeah, I have audio books, I have courses. Um, and if you need a session, you can even find me there for that as well. So that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone who's has watched or listened or, episode today and I hopefully you join me again to find out more information about the healing element podcast please visit my website kaimarie.com and until we meet again remember as Brandon says healing is a journey absolutely take care all right thank you guys